It's out after more than two years, the Ford report into the conduct of the Labour Party permanent bureaucracy during the Corbyn years is finally with us. It's kind of annoying and even embarrassing to still be litigating the Corbyn period uh, right now in 2022. For those of us who support the populist downward redistribution of wealth and power, the Corbyn project was an excellent vehicle for as long as it lasted, but it's kind of depressing to still be uh, talking about it so long after its fall. Unfortunately, uh, if we don't seize hold of the narrative uh, and, and how uh, the events of those years get told, then our enemies will. And so when an event like this comes along, it is incumbent on us to pay attention. The report, as I'm going to get into, broadly supports and vindicates the left's take on what happened during those years. Uh, there's been some great accounting of this from the left in Britain over the past few days. There's also been some very meaningful criticisms of Martin Ford's report from the left over the past few days. But there are also some important criticisms that I'm not seeing being made yet. And so I, James A. Smith, am interrupting my holiday here at Lake Windermere in order to bring you the popular show, Popular Mindset, Guide to Reading the Ford Report. So on April 12th, 2020, days after Keir Starmer took over from Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader, a leaked report appeared detailing conversations on WhatsApp between members of the Labour Party's permanent bureaucracy, which the authors of this leaked report claimed proved that they had been working against the Corbyn project. So the Labour Party is made up of uh, its elected representatives and their uh, teams, and they have their agenda, which has been approved by members or when in government by the public. And there is the permanent staff of the party, which are supposed to bring those ideas, ideologies and positions into reality and make the party run. What is clear uh, from those leaked um, uh, WhatsApp conversations is that the Labour Party was being run by people who had no intention whatsoever of realising the Corbynite vision that Labour members had voted in and actively worked against it. When that report appeared in 2020, uh, its contents were largely ignored by the mainstream media, as they always ignored anything that could be interpreted as being in any way pro-Corbyn. If there was any attention given to it, it was to criticise the fact that whoever leaked the report hadn't redacted the names of the staff members uh, involved. Keir Starmer called for an investigation, both of the contents of the report, the fact that Labour staff had been working against the elected leader and his project, not to mention the fact that they had been openly racist and sexist uh, against uh, other Labour figures in those work WhatsApp groups, and Starmer also commissioned the investigation to take in the circumstances under which this report had been leaked at all. This kind of double task sets the tone for Martin Ford QC's report, where he's simultaneously uh, kind of uh, handling both sides. He's simultaneously investigating the bad behaviour of the Labour staff and also the shortcomings and misdemeanours of the Labour leadership. However, it's quite clear that the first part of the task is the one that gave Ford his real meat. On all salient issues, this report redeems the left's narrative. The permanent staff of the Labour Party were meant to deliver Corbyn's agenda. Instead, they, uh, they, they deliberately sabotaged it uh, and worked uh, against it. Number two, uh, the persistent media narrative that Jeremy Corbyn defended his anti-Semitic friends uh, and stopped them being um, subject to uh, uh, Labour Party disciplinary processes is completely and palpably untrue. During the 2017 election, permanent staff did siphon off campaign funds to protect right-wing MPs, uh, although Martin Ford says that it is unlikely, in his opinion, that this meant that this was the reason why Labour didn't win the 2017 election, Steve Howell, who was an election 
uh, uh, campaign advisor to Corbyn at that time, also a friend of the popular show, Steve Howell has pointed out that Ford is very careful with his language there. In fact, the marginal seats that could have been won with that misallocated money could have forced a second general election, which all the polling said Labour would have won. So it's deeply serious that that money was uh, effectively stolen uh, uh, from within the Labour Party. And finally, the report finds that there was a hierarchy of racism within the Labour Party, where grievances relating to anti-Semitism and to Jews counted more than other forms of prejudice and other accusations of prejudice. Deeply damning of the party structures, but also deeply damning of Britain's media, which allowed a completely lopsided and topsy-turvy version of the events of those years, their heroes and their villains, to uh, uh, take, uh, take form in people's minds, um, with, with all kinds of implications for virtually everything that's happened in this country ever since. Tellingly, uh, the, the, the factual factional anti-Corbynites uh, of that time, all of those familiar faces, are no longer denying that the right weaponized claims of anti-Semitism during this period. Now they simply say that the right was, was right to do so. Uh, so the goalposts are, are, are screeching as they're moved. Uh, uh, we've got a totally different narrative, um, and it's good that this is, um, that this is out there. Maybe most importantly to me, this is a step towards perceiving Labour's anti-Semitism affair as a political struggle rather than a moral one. Overwhelmingly, we were told at the time that the left is kind of predisposed to anti-Semitism, this is a terrible thing, that Jeremy Corbyn is personally um, indifferent to uh, uh, anti-Semitism on the left and has even engaged it himself. It was represented solely as a moral failing. What this shows, if it needed showing, is that Labour's anti-Semitism affair came out of a, a, a political struggle within an organisation which incentivised um, maximal uh, claims of harm, incentivised uh, people to see uh, what anti-Semitism accusations were there in a kind of maximal form, incentivised people to ignore context, incentivised people to conflate minor transgressions to conflate legitimate uh, criticism of Israel with full-on uh, 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 you know, far-right tropes, of, 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 of Nazi tropes about Jews. Uh, and it also meant that the broad left, the broad kind of world of Corbyn supporters simply couldn't trust those processes and couldn't trust the accusations that were being made against us. It's also worth saying that many people on the left also were happy to frame this as a moral problem as opposed to a primarily a political problem. Uh, all that we heard about the fact that the left has to kind of look within and criticise itself, all of that stuff, like, okay, maybe, but it's far less important than this institutional context, that whatever was happening in Corbyn's office was happening while surrounded by uh, a totally illegitimate and undemocratic um, space of political action by people who shouldn't have been acting ideologically at all. Uh, so, yeah, for all those reasons uh, and for more, um, there's plenty for the, for, the, for the left and for Corbyn supporters to be satisfied with about this report. At the same time, there's no reason to be excited. First of all, we're still working with the same within the same media ecosystem that we were in the Corbyn years. Uh, and so although we might have kind of scratched away at some of that Overton window as far as uh, what it's acceptable to say without being called a crank or a conspiracy theorist about Labour's anti-Semitism affair or indeed an anti-Semitism uh, uh, anti denier. Um, however much that might have changed very marginally, we're still in a situation where all the headlines are, uh, are negative towards Corbyn. We're still in a situation where the, the same people and the same structures in the Labour Party are able to... Um, to, to, to spin this and represent the findings of this report in an anti-Corbyn light. Um, but there are, are other um, limitations to this report as well, and I'd like to see much more suspiciousness, actually, of Ford's recommendations, even as the left uh, and, and the Corbynistas 
um, I, I want to celebrate what is good for us uh, in in this report. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to read out a, a few passages and, and try to kind of draw something representative um, from them. So uh, first of all, this ki this kind of sets the tone for what Ford sounds like in the report when he's not simply detailing what either side did. Uh, this is an example, a representative example of Ford's editorializing um, in the report. I understand that politics arouses passions, Ford says, but amplified by the echo of social media, respectful debate was replaced by strident, often coarse, tribal and binary views. Um, elsewhere, he says, it seems to us that a willingness to see the good in people, even with whom we disagree, and to believe in the potential of people to learn and change is foundational to all successful progressive movements. One of the tragedies of this period for the party is that so many have lost sight of the humanity of those they see as being in an opposing faction, which is easier than ever in an age where so much of our communication takes place at arm's length through a screen. I think it is important that Ford recognises that Corbyn's Labour Labour was in some way a digital party. It was it, it was very highly highly mediatised through digital platforms, and that certainly had an effect both on the form that political debates of the time took, but also their content. Uh, it's hard to imagine so much about what the, the debates that went on in the Corbyn years and the struggles that went on in the Corbyn years in any previous time, in, in any time without Twitter and Facebook to um, mediate them. At the same time, uh, I, I think that the, the, the deep liberalism of um, Ford's uh, argument here is highly political in itself. It's easy to kind of mistake this as, as kind of a, a good-hearted argument that, okay, uh, the Labour right and the Labour left, the permanent bureaucracy and the elected leadership may disagree on many things, but uh, they should be working towards the same fundamental ends. Uh, and many people on the left have seized on this, first of all, to say, well, only one side uh, of this actually had a kind of legitimate claim to be pursuing their ends. One side shouldn't have been pursuing any ends at all. The labour rights in the permanent bureaucracy, uh, as opposed to in the um, I in Parliament, had no right to be pursuing any political agenda at all. Uh, and yeah, if, um, if 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 the Corbyn project um, uh, can be seen as highly factional, well, it had every right to try to reproduce or recreate the party in its own image. Um, however, I actually need to go to the right, go to the right wing, in order to find um, uh, uh, somebody who really kind of gets it, really gets what's wrong with Ford saying that if only people had been more kind, friendly and professional and had seen the good in each other, then uh, the Labour Party would have been a much more successful project. I've got to go to Luke Akehurst, um, who was one of these sort of minor... Uh, uh, Labour Party nobodies until, as happened so often in the Corbyn years, the left kind of memed him into disproportionate significance just because they hated him so much. Uh, he now um, has a prominent place on Labour's uh, National Executive Committee. Uh, and he tweeted this, the bitterness of 2015 to 2019 was because the stakes were genuinely high and ideological differences profound. If you consider your opponents to be linked to anti-Semitism and a threat to national security, and they think you are blocking socialism from happening, uh, then yeah, the, the stakes are extremely high. And the thing is that you, you might not like him, but Luke is dead right here, that actually it was highly factional. It was a complete struggle for supremacy, and neither side could see the good in each other. And they were right not to. They were right not to. Uh, Luke is perfectly, um, is perfectly accurate when he says that he considered us to be linked to anti-Semitism and a threat to national security. Now Ford would have it that we could sit down, you know, show our good hearts and explain exactly why we're not linked to anti-Semitism and why we're not uh, a threat to national security. But the problem is, according to his definitions uh, and within the definitions of the Labour right, we are absolutely linked to anti-Semitism, and we are absolutely a threat to national security. In their eyes, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are absolutely the same. In their eyes, if you are not a fully paid-up Atlanticist uh, for whom NATO can do no wrong, you are a threat to national security. That, that 
that is their ideology, that is what they believe, and that's why we were totally unacceptable to them, just as they should have been totally unacceptable to us. The problem with the Ford Report is that it wants to exist in a world where there are no stakes, and perhaps uh, that accurately describes a world where Keir Starmer is leader of the Labour Party and whatever um, mediocrity who has been brought in to replace Boris Johnson is in charge of the Conservative Party. That, that is a world of, of no stakes, whereas the, the, the world where Corbyn was the leader of the Labour Party was a very high-stakes world indeed. So um, the, the, the ma a massive problem with Ford's whole ideology and Ford's whole kind of uh, uh, unstated political stance in the report is that he ultimately doesn't believe that there's anything at stake in these ideological polarities. Our enemies knew better and we knew better. Uh, and and, and that, that is why factionalism was a perfectly appropriate um, uh, uh, attitude to take up during uh, those years of, uh, of the Labour Party. The report misunderstands the Labour right, in other words, just as much as it misunderstands Corbynism. Let's look at some of the um, specific criticisms that Ford makes of the findings of that leaked report. The important thing to note first of all is that this confirms the authenticity of all of those racist and sexist remarks, all of those confessions uh, to, about, about sabotaging Corbyn, all of those confessions uh, about being distraught that Corbyn uh, was so successful in the 2017 election, all of that is totally authentic, um, the, the Ford report finds. Um, but what is its analysis of uh, some of that awful um, commentary that we find um, in, uh, in those WhatsApp messages? A good example would be uh, the, 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 the commentary on Diane Abbott, which you know, it, it, whatever bar you hold for interpreting something as racist, saying that you want to be physically sick when you see uh, a, a, a black MP, uh, it, is it? That, 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 that's, that is not cool. Uh, and all of the commentary on Diane Abbott has all of that kind of pathology, uh, which meant that people during the Corbyn years on the right and also on the Labour right uh, were able to take such libidinal pleasure in hating on her. Uh, is, all of that is in evidence here. So Ford says this, In our view, the authors um, of the WhatsApp messages should have considered whether the fact that Diane Abbott is a black woman and has been vilified on that basis over several decades, A, might have impacted their instinctive responses to her, even if unconsciously, and B, meant that they should take particular caution with their language when discussing her. This uh, is, is very interesting and revealing, uh, I think, of um, Ford's whole approach. So in Ford's view, you could be on the Labour right and hold all the opinions that people on the Labour right hold. You could see Diane Abbott as a profound ideological enemy, uh, and but uh, as long as you cleaned up your speech or cleaned up how you spoke about her in uh, the WhatsApp groups, then you would be able to avoid being racist. It was completely the form and the style with which these people spoke about Diane Abbott, not the content of their opinions uh, as such that were racial in character. I think that this represents precisely the kind of misunderstanding of the labor right that I'm talking about. The labor right exists to represent the interests of the managerial class, the contract holders of privatized industries. Uh, it is there to make the um, pseudo left-wing case for war and for the arms trade. And most of all, it's there to keep socialists and radicals of all kinds out of public life. The personalized and physiological disgust that they were happy to express or allowed to be expressed in their WhatsApp groups about the senior black MP, Diane Abbott, uh, is not just unconscious bias, a racism that is out there in the culture that has snuck into their unconscious and sadly and unfortunately inflects how they talk about her. It's already there in the supposedly legitimate parts of their ideology in the first place. 
a black woman with a radical anti-racist, anti-war and far-left past who did not sufficiently renounce that past while staying in the public eye during the Blair years as a talking head and whose professional presentation did not meet their criteria for professionalism and yet nonetheless was promoted to the top of the party under Corbyn, all of this uh, could only result in a vicious hatred um, of, of, of this combination, a, a hatred that is a structural aspect of the labour right ideology. You can't think like they do and not be incredibly uh, antithetical to somebody like Diane Abbott, and you can't remove the racial component from it. Now, this isn't me saying, yeah, yeah, the labour rights are inherently racist. Maybe they are, or maybe they're not. What I'm saying is that there is inevitably a racial component in why Diane Abbott is so unacceptable to everything that these people stand for. You couldn't train that away with unconscious bias training that says maybe you've been uh, influenced by the culture that is racist. Maybe you've been influenced by um, the, uh, 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 the, the, the vilification that Diane Abbott has, has received. No, they've approved of that vilification or at least been able to overlook the fact that so often it was clearly racist uh, because it completely fits with their position. It, it, this is not a kind of um, a, an ideology that can have its malign aspect removed, like you can take caffeine out of coffee or sugar out of Coca-Cola. They go hand in hand with each other. Um, a, a, another kind of um, a, a kind of twin example uh, of this would be the warm praise that the MP Naz Shah receives, M Muslim MP who uh, was found to have posted what the report refers to as an anti-Semitic meme on um, social media, uh, who then, you know, deeply apologized, you know, accepted that she needed to learn about anti-Semitism, and therefore, in the report's eyes, becomes a kind of hero for how to react when you're accused of racism. Now, this seems to me another kind of outstanding example of how the report's liberalism, of how the report's signing up to a kind of um, an unconscious bias training, human resources view of racism, totally fails when it's applied to a political project and a political party. Now, Naz Shah herself, you know, she says that what she did was anti-Semitic and that seems to be the general kind of consensus. But what is not mentioned in Martin Ford's reference to an anti-Semitic cartoon is what the cartoon was of or where it came from. The cartoon was a big picture of a map of Israel transposed onto uh, a map of America. And uh, Naz Shah had reproduced that saying, this solves the problem uh, of, uh, of Israel-Palestine uh, and uh, might save America some money too. Uh, so what's our tick box here? That anti-Zionism is uh, anti-Semitism, that we're denying here the right of Israel to exist, uh, talking about money here, uh, you know, anti-Semitic trope of um, Jews as, as greedy or, or as usurers. Uh, it, it seems pretty straightforward to kind of run through our tick box that this has been an anti-Semitic incident. And like I said, Naz Shah describes it that way herself. What's missing here is that she was reposting it from Norman Finkelstein's account, uh, the, the great um, Jewish intellectual uh, an anti-Zionist and therefore somebody who is frequently uh, attacked by, um, by conservative and by some liberal Jews as well and by the mainstream. So already there's a complicating factor here that a Jewish political thinker produced the cartoon in the first instance. Add to that a few more layers that this could, as much as it is available to be interpreted simply as a kind of uh, denial of the Jewish right to self-determination. It's also, as much as it's a comment on Israel, it's also a comment on America and American funding for um, for, for, for Israel. And if we wanted to go that far, there's also the, the, the fact that in the history of Zionism there is a phase where America was contemplated as uh, a site for uh, a Jewish homeland to be constructed. So actually, despite the fact that Naz Shah kissed the ring 
and agreed, yes, okay, held up her hands and said, I've been anti-Semitic here. It, it is so clear to me that this was a complex kind of political moment and a complex moment of political discourse, and it helped nobody at all for Jeremy Corbyn to condemn the cartoon. It helped nobody at all for Naz Shah to um, go and uh, meet with the Jewish labor movement and meet with the board of deputies, meet with these right-wing Jewish organizations, uh, and basically, you know, plead for their forgiveness. All of, you know, Corbyn was within his rights to say what he said. Now, Shah was, in her, with, was within her rights to say what she said. But all that happened there was that what should have been plausibly acceptable political speech was now removed from the sphere of the acceptable. Even left-wing figures admit that this was out of order. Therefore, anybody who makes a similar joke, including Norman Finkelstein, uh, must be regarded as an anti-Semite from then on. Nashar's supposedly um, model behavior for what to do when you're called out for anti-Semitism actually just played into the hands of the right. It was a closing down of possible political discourse and, frankly, a betrayal of an important a Jewish voice uh, in, in these debates. So uh, hopefully those two examples of Diane Abbott and Naz Shah illustrate that Ford's idea of um, racism as unconscious bias and accusations of racism as being properly met with understanding, openness, and meeting with uh, the official kind of bodies of the, the, the offended ethnicity, uh, that both of those cases are a sort of depoliticizing of what is properly a political issue of questions of what it's acceptable uh, uh, to say and think and where racist attitudes and ideas come from and what their relationship is to other as aspects of ideology. There is a, a frankly comical moment in the piece where, in the report, where Ford um, applauds the party for undertaking a significant expansion of the HR department. Um, the, the idea that political disputes can be simply resolved by HR is almost a kind of joke in serious kind of debates and arguments about racism today. The conclusions of this uh, report are essentially uh, an idea that you could call HR on a political party and that could resolve insoluble differences of political ideology. Uh, another moment that I couldn't help smiling a little bit uh, at reading, if grimly, was this remark, the outrage rightly directed in recent years at the scourge of anti-Semitism should be matched by equally strong measures against all forms of discrimination. Now, the outrage directed at the scourge of anti-Semitism in the last few years, I, I can understand why a left-wing reader would read that and think, yes, yes, we should take other forms of racism and prejudice equally seriously. But if you applied the absolute hysteria, the absolute lying, the absolute mania, the like identity politics on steroids, which characterized the way people comported themselves during Labour's anti-Semitism crisis, if you applied that to every other plausible form of prejudice, then you would have an absolute nightmare on your hands. The answer is not that every form of um, uh, identity grievance needs to be taken in the same spirit that anti-Semitism was taken during the Corbyn years. Quite the contrary, we need a serious discussion about what the proper level of uh, uh, discussion and analysis of these problems is, what spaces it is appropriate for political parties' disciplinary machinery to get involved in these things. I would say that, yeah, if it's a work WhatsApp group, people should be speaking a professional language. If it's a, 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 a constituency Labour Party, if it is a conversation going on between ordinary members online, then there should be a far higher bar than there currently is for a party getting involved uh, and intervening and disciplining how people are allowed to speak to each other uh, in the party, especially when there has not been a, 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 when there is not an actual complainant. So uh, there's much more to say. I'm going to wrap up there. But yeah, the headlines are good news in terms of getting official recognition of the narrative uh, that uh, 
what was said about the left was palpably and substantially untrue during those Corbyn years. However, it would be a dreadful mistake if the left took the fact that Ford is very sympathetic to our case uh, in terms of the bare facts uh, as an invitation to follow him into uh, a, a kind of HRification of um, issues of, of equality and prejudice. The, the, the model for dealing with anti-Semitism during the Corbyn years was an abject failure on all sides, and it would be a disaster if we were to see the maximalist approach uh, and the depoliticizing, the idea that a, a QC can step in and adjudicate on what's the proper kind of political opinion uh, on, uh, on, on, on racism uh, and, uh, and, and, and relevant geopolitical matters is, is crazy. If you think that that is an appropriate way for the party to um, decide, its, decide on its problems, just imagine this. Imagine Keir Starmer, current scourge of the left, had not become an MP in 2015. Instead, he'd stayed an ordinary QC. Imagine if a, an incoming leader in 2020 had called on Keir Starmer QC to write this report. It, it, it's not a hard counterfactual to imagine. Anyway, more on this later, but that is the initial popular mindset take on the Ford report.